Welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast, where we talk with the people behind the current events and breakthroughs in brain implants in an understandable way, helping bring together various fields involved in neuroprosthetics. Here is your host, Ladin Yurichek. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast. Today's guest is actually two guests, which is James John and Jeremy Magland, and we talked at Society for Neuroscience. And actually, Jennifer French of Neurotech Reports sat in on the conversation, so you'll hear from her as well. James John and Jeremy Magland work at the Center for Computational Mathematics at the Flatiron Institute, which is a division of the Simons Foundation, founded in 2016 and located in New York City. So, enjoy. Yeah, uh, so here we are at SFN 2019. I ran into James Jun, 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 at one of the mini symposia or nano symposia or something like this. Very interesting stuff. You guys work at the Flatiron Institute in Manhattan and kind of doing computational modeling, spike sorting kind of stuff. And then uh, Jeremy Magland is also here with us. And so we're kind of just going to do some brief introductions. So uh, James, do you want to talk about a little bit about your background and, and what you're doing right now? Yeah, so I'm trained as a computer scientist and uh, physicist. And uh, when I was an undergrad, I started working on these extracellular electrode recording with these uh, microelectrode arrays. So, yeah, we were recording these uh, spikes from snail neurons. That's how I started uh, in neuroscience. And then I joined the lab in Ottawa, Canada, under Dr. Len Mailer and Andre Longten. So it's a collaboration between a physicist and neuroscientists trying to collaborate in a, in a very close manner over a decade or longer. And then I joined their lab so that I can learn both experimental techniques and theoretical analysis, so that, but also engineering. So I, I learned a lot about these instrumentation techniques and data analysis techniques. And I took this summer course uh, in Uzhol MBL and met Carlos Svoboda and he was at the time, yeah, he's based in Jaralia still now. And that's how I got connected with this uh, uh, Neuropixels project at Jaralia. So, yeah, my job initially was to develop these implementation technique and test out these different technological options to find out what is the best for majority of the neuroscience labs. But what we quickly realized, we didn't have the appropriate software tools to analyze this high density, high channel count recordings at a reasonable time. So I started de developing my own spike sorting uh, tool called the JR Clust, which, which stands for Genelia Rocket Clust. So when the project finished, I briefly joined this uh, startup based on Genelia, got uh, brain institute funding. And at the end, I ended up leaving the company to join the Flatiron Institute, who are developing spike sorting tools for different type of electrodes, for tetros and low channel count silicon probe electrodes. That, that's what Jeremy has been working on. Okay. And so before we get to Jeremy, actually, uh, do you want to explain spike sorting in just like a few sentences, in case somebody doesn't, doesn't know, one of the listeners doesn't know? Okay. So a good way to measure the neural population activity is to place these electrodes outside of the cell. So that way, you can listen to many neurons at the same time. But on the, as a downside, you receive the mixture of signals from many different neurons. So you have to computationally separate out these signal sources based on their characteristic waveforms and spatial locations. So the spike sorting is a, is a basically task to um, label neurons based on their spike waveforms. And with the advancement of hardware, we have more channels with a higher density sites. The spike sorting accuracy has been, has been improving thanks to this advancement of hardware. But software algorithms not necessarily took advantage of this uh, spatially redundant sampling. Yeah, and so that, that's what was good about the neuropixels. is it was oversampled, so you could really see where, uh, spatially, those, those neurons were. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, so Jeremy, do you want to uh, introduce yourself and uh, talk about how you got here? Sure, yes. Uh, so I'm Jeremy, Jeremy Magland, and originally I studied mathematics and 
found my way into the radiology department at, at Penn and did medical imaging. Uh, always wanted to get back into kind of the math side of things and the software development. And fortunately, uh, there was uh, an initiative at the Simons Foundation to create the Center for Computational Data Analysis. And they were kind of in search of opportunities in not, not just uh, neuroscience, but, but anywhere where we could make a difference by developing software tools for researchers. And so what uh, Leslie Greengard, who's the director of the data analysis group, um, after talking to several people, decided that spike sorting was a good target for maybe an un underserved uh, uh, application um, uh, for developing software tools. And so they originally joined as a consultant in that effort. Together with Alex Barnett, we, we kind of started to create tools for validating existing uh, spike sorting software. And what we found pretty quickly at that time, there was no fully automated kind of methods for spike sorting, but rather the labs would spend quite a lot of time just manually curating or kind of circling clusters in order to do the spike sorting. We realized that we can't really validate techniques if they are not reproducible and automated. And so then what we turned our attention to was creating a baseline algorithm that could go from beginning to end without any manual intervention. So that was the mountain sort software. Since then, uh, other software has, has developed to also be, have an automated mode. And so now we're kind of uh, going back to our original plan of trying to validate and compare different spike sorting techniques. Because it turns out that uh, uh, when labs choose a spike sorter, there are a lot of different factors that they consider. The less common kind of method that they use is which is the most accurate. One reason for that is because of the difficulty of just getting software installed, uh, getting the for file formats uh, properly aligned, and there's also precedent within the labs. So there's a lot of factors that, that kind of guide what a lab will use for, for their spike sorting. And also there's, there hasn't been tools for determining what is the most accurate method. And so that's what initiated our um, re most recent project, which is Spike Forest, uh, which is a website for comparing different spike sorting algorithms on ground truth data in a way that is objective and transparent and open so that it's not just like we're trying to demonstrate that our methods are, say, 10% better than other methods, um, which is, you know, is typically what a validation pipe, uh, publication would be about. Rather, we're putting it all out there and saying, you know, here are the different automated techniques, and you can just browse the website to, to determine the results. And I think that's another big thing uh, about Mountain Sort is that it's open source. You know, anybody can download it. So actually, in the Auto Lab, you know, I was I was helping you know a guy getting this all to put together, and that was like three months of installing it and everything like this. It was it was kind of a pain. Actually, let's let's stop. There's a rainbow. Look at this. Oh wow! Oh beautiful. <laughs> Whole one too. Look this is that. a. This yeah. must be a blessed interview here. It is, it is. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned mountain sort or rainbow. Concept. Yeah, exactly. I know, yeah, yeah. look at that. It's the chosen interview. <laughs> wow. It is, it is. Yeah. I saw some rain. It was raining a little bit, but uh, yeah, that's, that's amazing. That's amazing. You see the whole thing, right? Yeah. Um, There's a pot of gold at the end of it. Yeah, pot of gold, exactly. The, the <laughs> American right flag, in the for middle me, of the... it ends at the American flag oh, over there. Oh my goodness, look at that. So, that's, that's incredible. That's, uh, I think it's the American flag that's sending that off. It must be. <laughs> it must be. Oh, man. Okay. Should so we all sing Anthem now? Yeah. Yes, I feel My wife like taught it. me how, but I'm Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> you can sing O Canada, and that's okay. All right. <laughs> but let's yeah, take a step back. Of, of, yes. Can you explain to us what is Flatiron Institute, and like, what's the, what's the whole purpose of the Institute, and kind of how you talked about your projects within it, but could you just tell us a kind of an overview, a 10,000-foot level of what well, it is? I, I should just say, from my perspective, the benefit of Flatiron Institute is that the researchers there, including myself, are able to do, I guess, scientific research and software development, whereas in other typical research environments, the software development is not as emphasized and valued. And so, to me, developing software tools as a um, criteria for performance is important. And also, we don't have pressure to bring in external grant money. And so therefore, our, our focus can be more centered on directly solving scientific research problems. Is that your, uh, James, is that your experience as well? So money's not yeah. an issue. Yes, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> and you can focus on your actual task exactly. or what, what you've been trained to do, I guess, right? Exactly. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And if I want to add some more, 
from my perspective, is that a lot of these uh, software projects get studied uh, by graduate students, postdocs, but it often gets orphaned when they leave the lab and it doesn't get maintained as much. So an institute like Flatiron can serve the community by developing these uh, professional, very practical software for data analysis or simulation. So we have uh, four centers so far serving different areas of computational science. And now that the data is uh, becoming larger and uh, becoming more important part of the pipeline, I, I, I think we are going in the right direction of uh, pro providing this practical software for the community. So what you guys do is basically develop the software, make it open source so other people can use it? Is that is that kind of the That's right. model? And we feel very little pressure of competition in that way, because uh, which is good, I think. Because uh, I think cooperation in general is much more powerful than competition. And so we are, we are trying to help other labs. And we're successful when other labs use our software to further their research. So in that way, it, it kind of feels like there's a lot more freedom in terms of directly uh, addressing the, the problems at hand. So, very cool. Yeah, yeah that, that's amazing. I think that's a very important thing. Actually, this reminds me a lot of uh, Jost Wagner of uh, Blackfin, kind of standardizing spike sorting data and, and you know being able to potentially have other people uh, have access to it and uh, maybe compute it. Have, have you guys talked to them or do, do you know of, of, of them? Um, we can introduce you. Uh, oh, yeah, by the way, uh, we forgot to mention the Simons Foundation that uh, started this institute about three years ago. So the foundation has been around since uh, 1990, but it's only recent that they created this directly managed research center. So, so we, we are extremely thankful for generous uh, support by Dr. Jim Simons and Marilyn Simons. So you're fully funded by the Simons Foundation then? That yeah, is correct. Flatiron Institute is considered a division of the Simons Foundation. So, yes. what, what's the Simons? Uh, the Simons Foundation, so they fund many high-profile projects in neuroscience, such as a global Simons Collaboration on Global Brains and the SPARC, which is the uh, organization for um, autism research and, and, and many others. Oh, well, I'm curious if uh, you have open source software, do you hold any data? Do you guys, when, when your collaborators use your software, are, do you also have servers online that, where you're, you're holding that data and being able to see larger data sources? Or well, typically we provide the open source software, we, we, we host the open source software and then uh, labs would download, install, and use it on their own data. But there are some projects including the Spike Forest um, Spike Sorting Validation Project where we also host example data sets and data sets for uh, doing the validation on our own servers. So we want to provide both service, services. Often data sets are so large that it doesn't make sense to have labs send the data to us always. But on the other hand, we can also provide a service to some extent by taking representative examples and cre creating a, web a website that would show the results of um, of our software on that on that data. So we do uh, provide these collection of a ground truth data set to measure the the accuracy of the spike sorting. So we, we do have some ability to, to serve these uh, data sets for validation purpose. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Well, it was great yeah. to talk to you guys. Yeah. This was very interesting. and, and uh, Great to learn about your guys' existence, and uh, and it was it was nice to meet you, Jeremy. Something that uh, I, I struggled with, we struggled with for, for a few months, and and uh, yeah, it was really cool. And actually, on a high level, like how does mountain sort work? Like how does spike sorting work? And then how how are you going to be improving it in the future as well? Oh, so um, it, on our website, we actually compare ten different spike sorting algorithms. So they all have different strategies for for doing the spike sorting or or spike sorting can be considered as a clustering algorithm in a sense mountain sort in particular does the clustering by detecting uh, it's a density based method where it detects I'll take a step back and say that the it's the assumption is that each neuron is represented by a cluster in some uh, low dimensional feature space and that the most of the events are set, are concentrated at the center of that cluster and that two different neurons would be represented by two 
clusters that are separated by some sort of density dip in the number of spiking events. Not to get too technical here, but, but mountain sort uses a statistical method to uh, detect when those density dips occur and then uses that to separate the clusters. And how that's different from other algorithms is that it doesn't require any adjustable, tweakable parameters as input. In some ways, some people can think of that as a disadvantage because they want more control over, like, being, if they don't like their results, they can, they can change a parameter and hopefully, and hope that it, that things improve. But I consider that also as a disadvantage because the researcher might spend all their time searching a three or four dimensional parameter space. Um, and then there's a lot of inconsistency between how different labs use it. So that was the objective of Mountain Sort to really, uh, reduce the number of adjustable parameters. Going forward, there are some things that Mount Sort just doesn't try to address, such as the problem of overlapping spikes, um, drifting um, spike waveforms over time, and, um, and other aspects. So I've been focusing mostly recently on the um, validation website, but eventually plan to get back to the algorithm built. Very cool. Very cool. And then, and then the last question before you uh, head out. Uh, actually, James mentioned uh, yeah, a few days ago that there's some that are optimized for higher channel counts, like uh, Mountain Sword is good up to like 60 or something like this. And then, but if you want like thousands or something like this, then, then other other algorithms are better. And or how is how's the algorithm different? Oh, how, how are different algorithms? I, I think James would be more oh, equipped okay. to kind of... So I, ca I can talk about Iron Clust, which is designed for high channel count, long duration recordings for recordings that's pushing near terabyte range using local computer with, with an option to use compute clusters for a faster analysis. So algorithm takes advantage of the parallel processing in different dimensions. So clustering can be divided into detection stage where you filter the data and then detect the spikes and extract events and clustering stage where you group these similar events together to form groups of units. And at the end, there is an optional merging stage where you automate this uh, merging or splitting to minimize the amount of the manual work you need to do. The innovation of Iron Clust is to take advantage of the parallel processing at every stage of these three sorting stages by slicing data in either time dimensions or channel dimensions or the cluster ID dimensions to process these information simultaneously and algorithmically Iron Cluster employs graph-based clustering that links similar events in high dimensions in graph structure and it also addresses the drift by connecting time durations where probe, probe occupies a similar anatomical depth such that you are combining the data where probe occupied a similar positions in the brain. So, so why is that faster than... Uh... So the clustering is comparing neighbor to neighbor distances. So intrinsically, this is N squared algorithm. But Iron Cluster restricts the number of neighbors up to five minutes and not any longer. So it builds the graph in a local space time. But by building these graphs, you have enough overlap between these graphs that you end up linking all these events together in the global space. So you can take advantage of uh, parallel algorithms for accelerating machine learning operations such as k-nearest neighbors in GPU and also compute clusters to divide the data, analyze and recombine in a compressed format that, that lends itself well for parallel computation. Wow, fascinating stuff. I understood like a quarter of that, so <laughs> but uh, very cool. So this is this sounds very powerful, guys. Uh, it was it was very uh, good to be able to talk to you, sit down and talk to you. Uh, do you have any final thoughts or final questions or anything like this? Um, no, I'm just very excited going forward, and and uh, I think spike sorting is uh, people think of it as simple, but they're disappointed that <laughs> it turns out to be more complicated than they that they would like, but. We're, what we're trying to do is provide tools to, to kind of show what's really happening with the, with the different methods. And yeah, I'm also excited about the enhanced uh, hardware capabilities and enhanced uh, computing capabilities that really 
improves the speed and accuracy of the spike exhorting, so the science becomes more reproducible thanks to efforts that Jeremy is developing to compare and objectively benchmark different algorithms to find out what is the winning approach. And based on that, we can design even better algorithms. Very cool. Thank you. Right. Thanks a lot. Hope you enjoyed the show and were able to learn something new, bringing together different fields in novel ways. Until next time on the Neural Implant Podcast.